Okay, thank you. Well, so uh, for the moment, I have essentially described what are these uh, tensor networks, what are these objects, what are the complexity of their representations, how do we represent them graphically, and so on. But well, the question is now what, what do we do with this? And so in this part, I will uh, show you how to use them for approximation of functions and what we know about their properties. Uh, so first, let me introduce classical approximation tools uh, based on tensor formats. If you have a, a target function that you want to approximate, which is a multivariate function, u of x1 to xd, a first approach is to introduce finite dimensional spaces of x1, x2, and so on. Classical approximation space, or classical subspace of functions like polynomials, splines, wavelets, your favorite approximation tool for one-dimensional approximation, <laughs> and consider function in the tensor product of these spaces. This is what has considered Albert, for example. Albert exploited, uh, worked in polynomial spaces that are, whose basis is a, a product of univariate polynomials. So this would correspond to these function spaces being polynomial spaces. You take tensor product of polynomials, you live in a tensor product polynomial space. But afterwards, we will exploit low rank structures of the function in these spaces, okay? What Albert used was sparsity of the coefficients of the representation of function in these, uh, in these product spaces of polynomials. Here, what we will exploit is low rank structure. For example, if you use the tensor train format, it means that I will consider as an approximation to function represented like this in tensor diagram notation. I have here the feature maps corresponding to the basis of functions of the univariate function spaces. And here, the coefficient tensors of my, of my tensor train representation. Okay? This, what you see here, the, collection, the tensor network V1 to Vd, is the representation of the tensor of coefficients in the product basis associated with this tensor product space. Okay? So this is a classical way to, to define approximation tools using low-rank formats. You introduce basis of univariate function and consider low-rank approximation. If you do things like this, you will have to select your function of the different variables x1, x2, based on some knowledge of your function. If you are uh, trying to approximate analytic function, a reasonable choice will be here to consider a polynomial space. If you attack a Sobolev type function, function with Sobolev regularity, you will preferably maybe use wavelets or splines for the univariate um, uh, function spaces. You will have to select also this feature tensor space, okay, depending on the particular function you want to approximate. And on top of that, you will exploit lowering structure. And now an approximation tool. What is an approximation tool? It will be a sequence of sets of functions which has a certain rank bounded by R that lives in this function Vn, okay? N being a tuple, Nd. If I let free this parameter N, that means that I will play with the degree of the feature uh, uh, just space. So if I use polynomial approximation, I can play with the degree of my polynomial. So this is related to the n here, the dimension of the feature tensor space. I will play with the r, which is the rank that I impose associated with this 3t. And this phi n is this function in the tensor format I have presented in part one with a complexity bounded by n. Okay? This will define a hierarchy of subset of function with growing complexity. Of course, 
I have to define what, what I mean by complexity. I will come to this uh, later. I first present a second approximation tool using this tensorization technique introduced at the very end of part one. If you remember, I, a divariate function can be seen as a higher order tensor through this tensorization map okay, that gives me a tensor of order LD plus D. Uh, these variables here are associated with uh, the, the binary or, or encoding in base B of uh, different integers. And this dimension D is rela related to the local variables. Okay, so my multivariate function here is seen as a multivariate function like this, depending on some integers and some local variables. Okay, then what we will do to define an approximation tool, we will consider function in this, in, in this tensor space, where here you have RB tensor product LD times, and here you will have S, a subspace of function, Define on zero one, because clearly this space that you see here is infinite dimensional. Here you have all functions defined on zero one is an infinite dimensional space. To define an approximation tool, you have to approximate. You have to introduce sorry infinite dimensional spaces. So here I introduce functions, particular functions of the y variable. What I will consider mainly later are polynomial spaces, S. If you remember, that means that the function I will consider are splines, in fact. Okay? Piecewise polynomials. If S is a polynomial space, this is identified with the space of multivariate splines on a uniform partition of the hypercube. Okay? But this is a background space. And on top of that, I will try to exploit low rank structure of this multivariate function by imposing some of the ranks of this function. Okay? Um, so, in what follows, I will use the same uh, tensorization level for each of the variables. You could also define different resolutions for the different variables, but for the result I will show you, I consider the same uh, resolution L in each of the dimensions. So, here comes a uh, the approximation tool, I will introduce a set of functions in VL, in this tensor space VL, which has a rank bounded by R associated with a dimension tree TL over this set of, di of variables. And on top of that, I will, um, okay, sorry. And uh, if for TL, I consider this subset of linear tree, I consider for the tensor train format, this is a type of function I will consider. This is a tensor diagram notation of the function we consider. Here you have the feature maps associated with the space of functions of the y variables that take as input the different y1, y2, yd variables. And on top of that, you have here a tensor train uh, associated with the different variables that are either integers uh, here of the representation in base B, uh, or summation indices, okay? Uh, this type of, yes? So if you use uh, uh, polynomials for the y variables, uh, what you get at the end is uh, what type of approximation? Is it's a, it's a spline approximation, it's piecewise polynomial. Discontinuous. On, but uh, discontinuous. On, this, on the partition. Indeed, discontinuous. Okay. Yeah. Um, the construct and imposing a posteriori is a continuity or some differentiability is a tricky, tricky point. Uh, what I present here is very similar to what uh, many people like Kazev, Koromsky, Zoledet, Schwab considered the quantized tensor train format, but the procedure was different. If you, you introduce a certain basis with a certain regularity, and you will use this tensorization technique for the coefficient tensor, okay, but 
you tensorize just to tensor uh, the set of coefficients, and then afterwards you have the regularity of your basis functions. Okay? So they were able to consider piecewise linear approximation using these techniques with a number of knots, which is a power of two. Okay? Um, but this, this allows us to, to, have a presentation, uh, to have a presentation of um, an approximation tool in a, in a functional setting. This is the approximation tool we consider now. It's a set of functions whose tensorization at a resolution L is in TR, TL, VL for some R, some L, and here a fixed TL for a given L, and with a complexity bounded by N. Okay, so here I can play with the level of the tensorization, at which scale I look at the, at the function, and uh, I play also on the rank of the representation of these objects. So L and R are, complex, uh, are parameters here that are free, and I, to define phi n, I impose that the complexity is bounded by n. Okay. So now, what about the complexity? A very natural com measure of complexity of a tensor network is to count the number of entries of the different tensors of your network. Okay, so the first notion of complexity here, of full, I would say, full tensors network, is the sum of the number of entries of the V alpha, alpha uh, uh, living in the collection, uh, in the collection uh, T. You have another measure of complexity. If you want to exploit sparsity in the tensors of your network, okay, if you have some methods that are able to exploit the sparsity, I mean, having tensors in the network with many zeros. If you want to exploit this, then a measure of complexity, which is natural, will be the sum of the non-zero entries, uh, sum of the number of non-zero entries of your tensor. So in, here I introduce this called the L0 norm of a tensor, which just counts the number of non-zero entries. So depending on the measure of complexity you use, you will have two different approximation tools, one exploiting sparsity, the other not. Okay? And clearly you have that uh, phi n associated with the measure of complexity f will be included in phi n with the measure of complexity spar. Because if you, if you are able to represent uh, uh, an object with complexity n with full tensors, it will be also of complexity n with this sparse measure of complexity. Okay, so now that we have defined um, an approximation tool, we can define for a given function f the best approximation error uh, in phi n, where the error is measured in a certain banner space, space x. It's an infimum over all function j in phi n of the distance relatively to this norm, this x norm, distance between f and j. Okay? This is my best approximation error. And now the question we want to answer for a given approximation tool are first, does this converge to zero if n tends to infinity? This is, as you will see soon, related essentially to density results. Is the union of the phi n dense in the, in the space x? Another question interesting also from a practical point of view is does a best approximation exist? Uh, this is called a proximality property of the set phi n. We would like that for any f there exists at least one best approximation, one solution to this problem, making this infimum a minimum with a, uh, with a minimizer. But most importantly in practice, we would like to quantify how fast this converges to zero uh, for some classes of functions. Classical, I, I will show you some results for classical fun function classes and less classical function classes. And the last question we, uh, we, we can be interested in quantifying, trying to um, understand 
what are the functions for which this approximation tool will behave in a certain way. Uh, I mean, we would like to characterize what we call approximation classes. I will try to introduce some um, these notions at the very end of this part. Okay. Uh, there is, an, of course, another problem in practice. Is, is there an algorithm to solve this problem or to solve it approximately or obtaining something which is close to, to, to the best I can expect? This is another topic which is uh, very important in practice, of course, but I, I let it for later. Okay? First, I, I would like to, to tell you what we can expect from this. If this converges very slowly to zero, then you can you can go to another approximation tool, okay? If this go very fast to zero, okay, now you can, you can think about algorithm and try to, to build algorithms that achieve the optimal rate expected, okay? But at least we would like to, for, at the beginning, we would like to, to say what we can expect. <clears throat> okay, so uh, a few results. Um, as I said, so I will go quickly on this slide, you, you can have a look by yourself, but as I said, universality property, uh, which tells you that for all function f in x, you will have a convergence of the, the best approximation error is related to density. It's a density result. And from this first observation, if you give me an algebraic feature tensor space V for any tree T, the union of these sets over all possible ranks R is equal to V. Quite easy to, to, to show. Which means that if you play with a tool where the ranks are free, it's just like looking the properties of V. This universality property will be satisfied if, if the union of all possible feature spaces that you consider is dense in your space X. So here I give you several examples. Uh, for example, if you are in LP, P is strictly less than infinity, and um, for the first approximation tool you use polynomial or spline for the feature spaces, you will have this density result, and so universality. For the technique based on tensorization, since if I use locally functions that are polynomials in the local variable, Essentially, I'm working with spline spaces, so density results will follow from uh, density results of splines in LP spaces. So it's done for universality. Um, about proximality, uh, the first uh, observation is that for any tree T and any rank associated with this T, and any finite dimensional space V, we have the results that I mentioned previously that this set is a closed set in V. Okay? And I have defined my approximation tool, phi n, as a, the set of all possible functions with variable r and variable uh, dimension of feature spaces with a complexity bounded by n. So you can easily see that phi n is a, is a finite union of such sets. Okay? And, uh, and it is contained, you can prove that it is contained in a single finite dimensional feature space. Based on this, you can deduce that phi n is, is a closed set of this and therefore is proximal in X. Well, these are classical results uh, uh, of topology, which tells you that there exists a best approximation in phi n. Okay? This is a good news from practical purpose and also from some uh, approximation theory results that I will show you at the very end. Okay, now the, the, the point how, how fast we converge is what, what we call the expressivity of an approximation tool for a particular class of function. And now we have different strategies to, to analyze this expressivity. The first natural way to do it, and it has been done for many tools, and in particular for neural networks, that you take an approximation tool you, you know, like splines or trigonometric polynomial, polynomial approximation, you have approximation results for this tool, and what you do is just try to encode these 
spline approximation or polymer approximation using uh, these tensor formats. Okay? So if you know that uh, uh, a spline approximation converged like n minus 1, where n is a, the, the number of splines you consider, the dimension of your spline space, and if you are able to, to encode it with a number of parameters in these formats, which is in O of n, you will have the same rate. Okay? If, if it is in n squared, you will lose a little bit in your rate, but you will obtain a bound for your, uh, for your error. Okay? So use existing results, try to encode this classical approximation tool. Second thing is try to directly encode a function in this format. So you have to work on your particular application, try, trying to encode the function and, uh, and obtain, um, uh, and of course, trying to encode the function. If it is not exact, you have to control the errors in your encoding procedure. The last technique that we used for, uh, uh, for obtaining some results on particular classes of functions and that also Schneider, Ushmajev, Tem Yakov, uh, Ushmajev and Schneider used, sorry, uh, it's based on results on bilinear approximation that uh, Tem Yakov uh, worked on this and obtained some um, results for um, the, the, the convergence of the error of such approximations with respect to the rank for function classes uh, that are of Sobolev type or uh, function with Sobolev mixed regularity. Okay, so there are some results in the literature you can exploit. Uh, so based on the behavior of this bilinear approximation, uh, you can deduce from this approximation results for the tensor formats those who are associated with alpha ranks. Okay. Um, so now I would like to, to give you a few results. So it's a set of results that have been obtained by, uh, by different authors uh, for different classes of functions with uh, classical regularity of Sobolev type, Bezov type, or, or analytic functions. The first result that, we the, that I show you here is the result that we obtained with, um, with Mazen um, for uh, a large family of Bezov spaces. So here we are working in LP. We measure error in errors in LP. So the space X is LP. And I assume that I have a function with a certain Bezov regularity. Uh, where the regularity is measured in LP. Alpha is a regularity parameter, Q is an, an, additional, uh, an additional parameter that characterizes these space of spaces. But essentially, the, the result we obtain here, here I show you for Q equal infinity, for a function in B alpha LP infinity, you obtain an approximation error with full tensor network, which behaves like complexity to the power minus alpha tilde divided by d. So we are in d dimension here. Um, for any alpha tilde strictly less than alpha. So the interpretation of, of this is that you are near to the optimal rate. The optimal rate that you can expect for this class of function is known to be minus alpha over d. Here we are arbitrarily close to this optimal rate. Okay? So this result is for the, the approximation tool based on tensorization. So the interesting thing here, I would say that it is that um, the tool that you use uh, is always the same, whatever the regularity alpha. Okay? Because this result that we have obtained here is true, whatever the space S you choose, at least if you, if you have the constant, the, the, the constant function in your space F. The results, in particular, all for piecewise constant approximation. If you consider for S the set of constants, what you are doing is considering piecewise constant approximation on a biadic partition of your interval, but you exploit just the low rank structure of this object. 
Okay? So whatever the local polynomial degree that you choose, you will obtain this result, which is near to optimal for the same approximation tool. You don't need to adapt your tool to the regularity. Yes? Uh, yes, there is a question from the audience. Uh, uh, in this approximation result, do you choose a priori uh, the tree structure of the tensor, or do you need to consider any okay. uh, tree structure? Um, this is for the tensor train format. This result has been obtained for the tensor train format, but you can expect, uh, if you preserve this ordering of the viable and, considering, uh, and consider other, uh, other type of, tree, of binary trees, you will obtain essentially the same result. This is something we comment uh, in our paper with Mazen. Uh, so the tree doesn't have a lot of influence for this class of function. Okay? But afterwards, in the next slides, you will see I will give you some, some slides, some, some intuition about the influence of the tree, and I will show you some functions for which the choice of tree is really crucial. Okay? So, for the moment, you have some flexibility. Similar result could, could probably be obtained with other choices of, of tree. N is the, the number of parameters of your tensor network. You count the number of, uh, of entries of, of the tensors of your network. So, uh, in, in this case, it doesn't matter if you increase L or if you increase the resolution of your space S or if ah, you okay. increase the rank? Uh, or so indeed, in phi N, phi N contains tensor with different resolutions, different ranks. So if you, if you look at the, at the proofs, you will see, you, you will have estimates of the, what is the L that you need for achieving a certain error and so on. You have to look at the, more precisely at the proof to um, to see what are yeah what you need for the ranks how be how the rank behaves and how uh, how the level uh, the resolution behaves okay so the, the, the approximation that you find that depends on, on f is a nonlinear of course is a nonlinear type of approximation so essentially here what we achieve is a, a rate of linear approximation the result is obtained by encoding splines. You take splines, defined on uniform partitions, and, uh, and you encode it, and you encode them within these uh, tensor networks. And essentially, you have a, if your splines, uh, the spline space is of dimension n, you will have O of n uh, complexity, O of n log n complexity for the, for the encoding. And that gives you the, the, this little loss of rate this logarithmic factor, but it's almost n complexity if you have a spline of dimension n to encode it within this format. And if you look at, at the paper, you will, you will see what is the resolution you need, what is the rank you need for encoding a spline with a, in a spline space of dimension n. Okay? Okay. Um, so here I told you that even if I use um, piecewise constant approximation, uh, the fact that we obtain almost optimal complexity uh, is due to, to this uh, freedom we have on the resolution. Uh, so here, the depth of the network, letting the resolution grow, is really crucial to capture this uh, extra regularity. Use piecewise constant approximation, but, but you are able to obtain what is achieved by splines of a degree which is related to the regularity alpha. Okay. Okay, same type of result is obtained for uh, a wider class of Bezov spaces, where now you have the same alpha regularity, but it is measured in a, in a weaker norm, L tau, with, with tau which is lower than P. And uh, we know that to achieve optimal uh, performance for these spaces, you have to go to nonlinear approximation. Uh, this can be done by sparse approximation with using wavelets or a free knot spline approximation. Uh, we used both with Mazen to obtain some results on these spaces. So, yeah, we have encoded this 
nonlinear approximation tool within three, three tensor networks to obtain a result which is almost the same as before. The, the performance is in n minus alpha prime divided by d, whatever alpha prime, strictly less than alpha. So almost optimal performance. But here you see that the two is associated with a sparse complexity, which means that to, to achieve the near optimal performance, you need to exploit sparsity in, your, in the tensors of your tensor network. If you don't exploit this sparsity, what you obtain is just a bound, which is in alpha prime divided by 2d, so you, lo you lose a, a factor 2 here in the rate. It's not too bad, but what, what we have obtained is that you need to exploit sparsity in the networks to, uh, to achieve this optimal performance. Okay. Um, uh, very rapidly, I don't go into the detail of this, but uh, there are also results using QTT or this particular uh, form uh, approximation tools we have introduced with Mazen for analytic functions. And we exploit here what we know from polynomial approximation. If you have a, a function defined on an interval, so there is a typo here, a function from 0, 1 to, to R, and which admit an analytic extension on an open complex domain, uh, which is defined as a set of, uh, of uh, complex numbers whose distance to the interval 0, 1 is bounded by something depending on a row, on a row constant, row strictly greater than one, you can show that the convergence will be exponential, uh, almost exponential in n. In fact, it's a factor gamma to the power minus n to the power one over, over three. So it's a very fast convergence. You obtain this result by encoding polynomial approximation, essentially. Okay? This expo you, polynomial approximation as an exponential convergence with respect to the number of polynomials. And remember, in the first part, I told you that polynomials can be encoded in this format with a rank bounded by the degree plus one. So we use this to uh, obtain, at the end, a tensor network that are approximate almost optimally uh, an analytic function. You, you lose a little bit here, but not too much. So, I mean, the, even if you use piecewise constant approximation, you see that this tool is also adapted to analytic function. It will ex exploit this extra regularity without changing the, the tool. There are also results on uh, functions with singularities. If you consider this function u of x, which is x to the power alpha with the alpha between 0 and 1, so it's a function in L, infin L infinity. So you can think about using piecewise constant uh, linear approximation for this. I mean, you, you subdivide your interval in a uniform partition and you do piecewise constant approximation. Uh, what we know is that the convergence will be in n minus alpha with such a linear approximation too. So it can be very dramatic if alpha is small. You can go to nonlinear approximation by using piecewise constant approximation, but with three partitions by adapting the partitions to your function. And here you come up with a rate which is n minus 1. And this rate is known to, to be optimal for this uh, wise constant approximation in these uh, spaces. So here u, u is a BV function. So this is a quite classical result, what I show you here. And the uh, Last thing is that now, now, if you consider piecewise constant approximation on a, B, on, a diad, on, a, on a biadic partition of your interval, but on top of this, you exploit low-rank structures of your functions, you come up with an exponential convergence with respect to the complexity of your tensor network. This rate is achieved by HP methods. I mean, spline approximation, where you adapt the mesh and also the degree per, uh, per interval. You can play on the local degrees and uh, the local size of, of your mesh, okay? So it, is also, uh, it has also the performance of this HP adaptive method. Um, a few words on the i-dimensional approximation. 
Um, so, as you have seen before, if I consider base of spaces of functions defined on the, the hypercube, we have seen that we, we achieve almost the optimal rate n to the minus alpha over d. But clearly, this rate deteriorates with d. So, you will have what we call the curse of dimensionality here. That means the complexity you need to achieve a certain precision grows exponentially with respect to the, to the precision you want. Okay? But this is inevitable. I mean, if you want to, you cannot provide an approximation tool or a reasonable approximation tool <laughs> with, uh, as Albert uh, uh, explained you about this uh, notion of nonlinear ways or stable nonlinear ways that describe reasonable approximation tool with continuous parameter selection. What you know is that you cannot expect a tool that will do uh, better than this rate. Or said in an another way, you will always find functions in this base of spaces such that um, uh, you have the curse of dimensionality. Whatever the tool, whatever the reasonable tool. Okay. So you need more structure to address, uh, you, you need to say more about your multivariate function when you are in high dimension. This could be mixed regularity of your function. So what, well, what we obtain is that for mixed Sobolev uh, or mixed, mixed Sobolev or mixed base of regularity, the sparse tensor networks achieve near to optimal rate, which are known from a hyperbolic cross approximation uh, rate in n minus alpha, where you see there is no d in the rate here, it's complexity to the minus alpha. And here the d appears, but as an exponent of a logarithmic term in n. So you have still the curse, but a milder curse. Okay? Uh, we have obtained also results for anisotropic smoothness, uh, where you obtain a rate depending on what we call the aggregated smoothness. So if you have anisotropic regularity such that this exponent is independent of d, so you will need more and more regularity in your variable, you, you can have classes of functions like this for which you, 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 do, you don't see the curse in this, uh, at least in this rate. I don't talk about the constant here, okay? The curse may, may pop up from the constant that, uh, that are here, but at least for the rates, for a fixed d, you may have problem, uh, you may have some classes of functions with a, with a good behavior for this past tensor network. Uh, the curse of Dean can be circumvented for non-usual function classes. You can, and uh, people played with this in, in, uh, for neural networks. So we, we played the, the, the same game with uh, Marcus Bachmeier and Reynold Schneider and uh, considered uh, classes of functions that are compositional functions. You compose here multivariate functions that, are, that have a certain uh, regularity. So here, different function you see here. The compositional structure is related to dimension three that you know. And the function that you compose are uh, assumed to be uh, in some Sobolev space with a certain regularity k. And the result we, that um, Mascar, Yao and Poggio obtain for ReLU network is that you can uh, approximate this without the curse under some assumptions. And these assumptions are essentially the same that we have obtained for tensor networks. So the, 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 the conclusion is essentially the same, is that the complexity you need for achieving a certain precision epsilon behaves like this. Uh, epsilon to minus three over k, there is no dimension here. Okay. There is a dimension here, but that appears in a polynomial term. So this is not the curse, okay? But to have the curse, you need exponential dependence on the d. And the d appears also where you see a l. The l is the, the depth of the tree which is considered here, the number of layers of composition of function you consider. So here it's polynomial in n, uh, in l, sorry. And here it's exponential in l. The l, if you consider a balanced tree like this, the number of layers of a balanced dimension tree is logarithmic in d. 
Okay? So if L is logarithmic in D, this will be a polylog term, and this will be only a polynomial complexity in D. Okay? It's an exponential of a, logarith of a logarithm, so you, you will have polynomial complexity in D, which means that here, uh, for a compositional function associated with balanced trees, you don't have the curse. Okay? If you consider a linear tree, which is associated with a tensor train format, okay, a composition of many functions, you will have, if the tree is linear, you will have L, which is O of D, okay, and then you will have the curse uh, related to this term. But now if you are, uh, if you compose um, reasonable functions, I mean, the B, what is the B here? The B is the Sobolev norm of the function that you compose. If you restrict these functions to have a Sobolev norm bounded by one, which means you, you don't want that your function os oscillate too much, okay? Uh, then you don't have the curse anymore also. So you can avoid the curse for particular functions associated with binary trees, or for a reasonable function where you compose function with a, a bounded, uh, a Sobolev norm which is bounded by one. Okay, so, but you see the, the work is here on the very specific class of functions, so you can, you can play yourself and try to, to introduce new classes of function, try to see what is the performance. So of course, it has to be related to particular applications. Uh, uh, the functions that, uh, that we consider here, may be related to uh, hierarchical systems of decisions or uh, nested uh, computational codes in UQ or so, uh, where you see that the output of a code will be the input of, a, of a, another code. Uh, okay, so it can explain the performance of tensor networks for uh, approximating the relation between output and input of this highly structured uh, simulation code. Okay, now we come with a question, uh, we, with a problem that has been uh, many questions. What is the effect of the, the influence of the choice of tree? What is in, or let's say, no, first, in the first step, what is the influence of the format? What is the power of the canonical format compared to hierarchical format? Canonical, uh, Canonical format is used a lot in, in many applications. So there are interesting results. So first, what we have seen before is that the alpha rank of a tensor is bounded by the canonical rank, which means that a tensor in this set of tensors with canonical rank bounded by R can be encoded in these three based formats with ranks all bounded by R. Okay? The encoded will be a little bit uh, expensive because uh, now you will have to store higher order tensors in your tensor format. So you will have essentially a complexity which is like this for the leaves and like this for the core tensors. So you will have now a polynomial complexity in the rank where the canonical format was just linear in the rank. Okay? So you lose a little bit, but at least you are able to, uh, you don't have the curse of dim dimensionality appearing in this en encoding, switching from canonical format to uh, tree based format. In the other way around, uh, it's a result that has been obtained uh, in the last years, interesting result, which, which says that for a balanced tree or a linear binary tree, if you consider the set of tensors that admit a representation with bounded ranks R, with all ranks bounded by R in these three based formats, and such that the rank, the canonical rank, is lower than something exponential in D, this set is of Lebesgue measure zero. In other way, if you look, 
at it in probabilistic terms is that if you pick randomly a tensor here in tree-based format with all ranks bounded by, let's say, 3, there is a probability 1 that you will obtain a canonical rank which is exponential in D. Okay? Um, this is for exact representation. I would like to see a similar result for approximate. Uh, to, my, to my knowledge, there is no, uh, no such things for approximate representation. Maybe you can, if you pick some object in tree-based format, maybe there is an approximation, a reasonable approximation without the curse in this canonical format, but yeah, I, I don't know. Up to my knowledge, uh, I don't know such results. Okay. Um, okay. More on the uh, now on the influence of the tree. Remember these additive functions. If I consider a function which is a sum of univariate functions, all alpha ranks are bounded by two because you can write this function as a sum of a function of x alpha plus a function of x alpha complementary. So and uh, and obtain a. a, a two as a bound of the alpha ring. Okay. But usually different trees will lead to different complexity of representations for other functions. But there are some results that are given here that tell you that a balanced tree or linear tree will have similar performances. The result is that if you have a, a, a tensor network here, associated with a linear tree with all ranks bounded by R, you can encode them with a binary tree, a new tensor network associated with a, with a new tree, uh, with the ranks bounded by R, um, by R, R to the power 2. Okay? So you, will you may lose a little bit in terms of complexity, but not too much. On the other way around, if the rank associated with this tree are bounded by R, you know that the rank associated with this tree will be bounded by R to the power of log of D. So here, for very high dimensional approximation, you may lose more, going from balanced tree to linear tree. Now, um, I will play a little bit with uh, permutation of vibers, because here, the result I gave you was going from a balanced tree to linear tree, but the way I order the variable is the same. Okay? Now I, I will consider permutation of, of my variable by introducing a permutation of the set of dimensions 1D. Permutation is denoted sigma. And I consider uh, different trees, T sigma, which are obtained by permuting the variables. Okay? So the nodes of this new tree will be sigma alpha where alpha is, a, is an element of T. Um, what you have is that, in general, if the rank associated with this tree is bounded by R, the rank of this will depend on D. Okay? So it will depend on, on, the, on the permutation you have. So let me take an example. Mazen, did... The, you do, okay, you considered this example in the, in the end end session. So you will play with this function, n and i less potential, which is a function, which is a polynomial function. It's a sum of uh, bivariate functions. So here it's a sum of univariate uh, polynomials, but here you see a sum of product of, um, of variables, xi, xi plus 1. So this is a bivariate function. And this is, these are also bivariate functions. OK. What you can show is that if you consider a linear tree with variable, which is a natural linear tree having the nodes 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, that respects the ordering you see here, OK, um, then the ranks are all bounded by 4. And the storage complexity in tensor train format is O of D. But now if you consider this permutation, suppose that you don't know your problem. In physics, you don't know how your uh, atoms are organized. So you don't know really uh, how these atoms interact. So you don't have the, 
the, the ordering, and you choose this bad, bad format, bad, bad tensor train format associated with this ordering of the variables, then you can prove that the storage will be t d to the power 3. This is not so dramatic for this function, but you, you lose a bit. In high dimension, you lose a bit. But now here there is another example. You can look at it. Uh, don't go. Uh, I go very quickly on it. It's a function that represents the density of a Markov chain. Um, oh, sorry, no, the, the, the probability uh, function of a Markov chain. So it's a product of bivariate functions. Uh, this function represented conditional probability. Uh, and for this function, what you can prove is that the encode, if all functions, all the bivariate functions here as a rank bounded by R, you can encode this in a tensor train format with a complexity R4. If you know the ordering and if you use a tensor train format with a good ordering of the variable x1, x2, x3, and so on. What you can prove also is that the canonical rank of this function is exponential in D. So canonical approximation will not perform well for, for, for this type of function. But also, if you consider a tree with a bad ordering of the variable, a tensor train where you don't know really the conditional dependence of your, uh, of your random variables, you may come up with a complexity exponential in D. So okay, these are just examples. I have no gen general theory about this, but just on, on specific examples, you see very you see that the choice of the tree is really crucial. And, um, but the problem, of course, is that uh, if you have a problem in high dimension, the number of possible trees is astronomical. Okay? Uh, the number of binary trees over 1D is known as a Catalan number. It's something super exponential. Exploring all possible trees and then selecting the best one, something which is not reasonable, of course. So there have been some works on uh, constructive approaches, trying to build a tree based on some, uh, some criteria. We have worked also on stochastic optimization procedure, but you, you have to propose a good way to explore the set of all possible trees. So you, you are constructing a, a random walk over all the set of all possible trees, but how to propose a new tree from a tree you have, it's, it's not a completely satisfac satisfactory what we have at the moment, but we, we are still working on it. Um, okay, maybe for the last uh, part, because time is running, uh, I will just uh, comment briefly on some uh, results we have obtained with Mazen on what we call approximation classes of uh, tree tensor networks. So they are very similar to results that have been obtained by Gribonval, Coutignoc, and co-authors for, ne for ReLU networks. We obtain essentially the same result for, for these tools. First, the first observation is that they satisfy properties of classical approximation tools. For example, they are cones. If you consider a function in phi n, you multiply it by a constant, you are still in phi n. Uh, they have an, by the definition of phi n, there is a natural nestedness property. Phi n is included in phi n plus 1. But most importantly, the, 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 the property on which we, we work more was this P4 property, which tells you that your set is not too nonlinear. If you had two functions in phi n, so it's not a linear space, so you are not in phi n. But you arrive in phi c n with a certain constant c greater than 1, okay? Which means that complexity of storing sums of functions of complexity n is O of n, okay? If the c is equal to 1, it means that your, 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 your set phi n is necessarily a, a linear space. So of course, c will be higher than n, we are able to obtain upper bound for this c. Uh, the next two properties, I have discussed them already. In the case where x is equal to Lp, uh, you have a density result, so called universal, universality result, and you have uh, 
result and existence of best approximations. Okay, what do you do with this? These properties are classical properties for uh, obtaining, uh, uh, for exploiting results on, from approximation theory to say something about approximation classes of these tools. What is an approximation class? It's uh, a set of functions for which you can expect a certain rate of convergence n to the minus alpha. I would like to say what are the properties of the space of all functions for which the tool will perform like n to the minus alpha. Okay? So what we have seen before in expressivity, what we have seen is that if I have a function which is in a Sobolev space in dimension d, I can expect uh, a rate in Sobolev regularity divided by uh, the dimension. Okay? So it will leave in a space like this with alpha equal to Sobolev regularity divided by, by alpha. But I would like to understand more because, okay, we have seen also that analytic functions live in some space, such spaces. Uh, many Bezov functions with different regularities live in these spaces. I would like to say more about these spaces. So the first result that you obtain from standard results in approximation theory comes from properties P1, P4, and that tells you that the set of all functions can, that can be approximated with this rate is a quasi banner space. It's a linear space, which means that if you have a function that you can approximate with a rate n minus alpha and another one with the same rate, if you add these two functions, you will observe the same rate. Um, Depending on the complexity measure you, want, uh, you, you use, you have different approximation tools, so you, you will have different approximation classes. Um, the approximation class, when you use a, a sparse complexity, is denoted here S alpha, is denoted F alpha if you use uh, the full complexity, and from the relation you have between the different approximation tools, you have some inclusions between these approximation classes. The approximation class uh, of full tensor networks here will be included in the, in, in the approximation class of the sparse tensor network. And you have another result saying that you, by encoding the sparse tensors in full tensors with higher ranks, you can obtain also this other inclusion with a, a little loss in the, in the rate. So from this, you, from the expressivity results, you obtain that base of spaces, mixed spaces, and isotropic spaces, and so on, are included in, a, in the approximation classes of these tensor, uh, tensor networks. Uh, this is a direct consequence of the result I showed you before for base of, and, uh, for base of spaces. But an interesting result that we obtain also is that the approximation class of functions that can be approximated with the rate alpha with this tool is not embedded in any base of space. Um, Albert mentioned this, that in fact, we know that we know the approximation classes for several tools. Like we know that spline approximation, um, the, the, sorry, the approximation class of spline approximation on a uniform partition is in fact a Sobolev space. So you are able, these approximation classes are known for, for, from some approximation tools. So you have a direct, you have an equivalence between this, uh, uh, be, between approximability, approximation rates, and uh, the space of function. Okay, you can read from the convergence rate of a function when you use spline approximation. You can read the, the regularity of the function, and this is not the case for this. This is not the case as well for neural networks. If you converge with this tool with the rate alpha, it does not tell you anything about the rate, uh, about, sorry, about the Bezoff regularity, okay? So what is the, the consequence of this is that tensor networks may be useful for uh, other classes of function or functions that are not described solely by, uh, by their local regularity. 
Okay, um, some open questions. What I, what I showed you was uh, results for tensor networks associated with tensor, with a tensor train format. Uh, you can play a little bit with the, the format um, and obtain for a fixed format, uh, fixed tree or fixed families of trees, similar results. But the open question here I, I, I ask is, what is, uh, what would be the performance of an approximation tool where you can play with the tree? So you could consider the set of all functions that lives in this tensor format I have uh, presented, but for arbitrary trees. Here the tree is a free parameter. So of course the expressivity of such uh, approximation tools will be higher than, uh, than the, the ones I have presented. Working with this will be much more complicated, as I mentioned, uh, optimizing over trees, trying to find a good tree and so on is a combinatorial problem. But this is an interesting question. What can we expect uh, by playing with the tree uh, and obtain quantitative results from this? Uh, and also open questions on what are the expressivity or approximation classes or more general tensor networks? I think there is a, a lot of uh, open problem there. Uh, I've finished with this approximation part. If you have questions, you can take some questions on approximation. Is all this so? When you have standard method uh, wavelets, you, you compute the coefficient, you threshold when you have... Uh, yeah, okay. Right, uh, so for example, I give you... Uh, I have answers in the, in the next part. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you partially. Uh, you will see that w we have, and based on this uh, singular value decomposition and truncation method, uh, so it's not a uh, thresholding of, uh, of wavelet coefficient and so on, it's thresholding of singular values, but there are algorithms that allows to, to do this truncation, and you have some guarantee at the end for this algorithm. Uh, essentially, this is the only way to obtain result based on this singular value de decomposition, because, uh, and I will mention it, if you try to optimize directly in this set and use optimization methods, it is known to be NP-hard to find minimizers. So in practice, you don't know really what you get. Le yeah, yes, that's it. If you have techniques, and I will show you these techniques that uses this truncation method that are well controlled, uh, under some assumption on your algorithms or so, at the very end, you can combine these approximation results and the algorithmic results and, and obtain something. But uh, there are also uh, for, uh, situations where we use these tensor networks in, like, uh, in statistical learning in particular, they are used a lot today, and uh, with uh, direct optimization methods, minimizing uh, risk functional over this set. And for this algorithm, we have no guarantee because we, yeah, we don't know what we obtain. What we would need is a, a quasi-optimal approximation, but this is not guaranteed by an available algorithm. I will comment on this. So there is, a, there is yeah. another question from yeah. the audience. Uh, on slide 87, um, so it says that uh, the choice of a tree is not crucial. Is there a loose characterization or intuition for which class of function um, this is true? So uh, yeah, yeah. Here I, I show you a particular example, but I have no general um, comment on this. I mean, just observe that for, for, for some functions you have this... Uh, you have to precise the structure of the function to have an answer to this question. Does the tree will have an influence or not? Yes, so, and then the, the same person asks, is there a second example? Is there another example of a function uh, for which is true? Uh, that the tree does not have an influence? Um, 
if you consider okay if you consider so sobolev uh, fun function with sobolev regularity uh, with the first approximation tool i considered uh, or the second is the same means that um, no that was the first one you remember the first was for function of univariate for spaces of univariate functions, I, I use a spline space or a wavelet space adapted to the regularity of my Sobolev function. Here, whatever the tree you use, uh, you will obtain uh, the same type, of, uh, the same rate of convergence, n minus uh, alpha divided by d, whatever the regularity alpha. Uh, here, the only assumption I do is type of isotropic smoothness, okay, if I just say it's in, it's in uh, B alpha or W alpha, it's just a, a isotropic irregularity, not, not much structure, and here the tree does not, does not, is not really important. If you start to say that there is some uh, structured, some anisotropy, some structured regularity in your function, then the, the tree may have an influence. So I would say, if you, have, if you tell me your function is of Sobolev type, it's in the space uh, that I denoted d W uh, alpha infinity, for example, then the tree does not have an influence with the first approximation tool I present. So this is another example. Yes? Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, Albert uh, mentioned uh, a result uh, um, that is um, first of dimension free for this polynomial approximation of uh, parametric PDs. There are other results around, for instance, on weighted uh, corobuff spaces uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. Um, do you think you would, uh, so in ve very high dimension or infinite dimension, but with a uh, strong anisotropy and weights uh, so that you can build approximations that uh, are first of dimension free? Do you yeah. think uh, those uh, results would uh, extend yeah, from, from the Yeah, for me, the, tran the transfer, um, so we did not co consider corobus spaces, um, but or anisotropic corobus, but they are very similar to the anisotropic uh, Bezoff I, I showed you. And if you have uh, this aggregated smoothness, which behaves like O of D, you don't have the, the curse, at least in the rate. Yeah, the question is whether you can control the uh, constant yeah. as well. And yeah, the constant, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was your question. Okay. Um, I think it, it is okay. So there are, there are some results on the encoding and sparse, sparse approximation in tensor formats. I don't remember exactly if there is a, a, an exponential dependence somewhere, but I don't want to, to say something wrong, but I think you can encode with polynomial complexity a sparse approximation within this format. So maybe you will lose something in the rate, but if you don't have the, the curse with sparse approximation, you should not have it with, with this. Um, Akbush had, had some results on sparse to, to, to hierarchical tensor formats conversion. conversion. There have been also works from Schneider, I think. but. Okay, I have to look at the literature, and maybe I will, I will put the references at the end uh, of the slide if I go back to this, uh, if I find again these references. Okay. So the last 40 minutes, uh, I would like to... Uh, give you a an overview of some uh, algorithmic aspects, um, how to work with these tensor networks as to construct in practice approximations. As I said, at the very beginning, algorithms will depend on the setting, which type of information you have on your function. Is it pointwise evaluation of your, of your function or tensor? Is it an equation satisfied by your tensor? Maybe you know that the solution of your problem is a minimizer of some functional. So there it will be quite natural to just optimize this functional over this 
tensor format. This is what is done typically in statistical learning. You have a certain risk function to optimize. You know that the target function that you are looking at, like your density of a distribution or a regression function, is the minimizer of this functional. And you will, obtain, you will optimize this on your tensor network. OK. Um, The algorithms I will mention, most of them uh, are available in different libraries. There are today uh, many, uh, many uh, libraries available, many initiatives starting also to do things more uh, efficient than what exists. Uh, here I mentioned two, uh, two libraries we developed in Nantes and that are available on, on GitHub. There is a link in the PDF. You can go to them. There are some tutorials. Uh, there is one library in Python. The other one is in, uh, in MATLAB. The Python one has been done after the MATLAB. There are more things in the MATLAB toolbox. Not all has been converted in, in Python. Uh, at least uh, um, truncation techniques, uh, learning with tensors, they are available in, in, the, in, the, in the two libraries. In the MATLAB toolbox, what you, will sh what you will have is also the manipulation of operators acting on tensors, operators in tensor formats. That allows you to consider uh, equations, PDEs, where operators are in tensor format and, uh, and uh, apply uh, algorithms to solve equations. This is not available today in, in the tensor uh, library. OK, and tomorrow in the practical session, uh, Mazen decided to do something more basic. You will use NumPy. Try to see how to, uh, what is tensor, what are tensors, what are uh, what is tensor algebra in Python, and uh, there is an exercise at the very end uh, using this library. I don't know if you will uh, arrive to this final exercise, but at least you you will see some practical uh, use of um, of advanced functions. Uh, in this library. OK. Um, I will do a selection in this. <laughs> OK, first, the, main, the, the important tool I would like to, to discuss in detail is what I mentioned uh, before and what, what I answered to Albert. It's the higher order singular value decomposition and uh, how to truncate tensors that, have, that are given. So <clears throat> you have a tensor U. I assume that the tensor is in a Hilbert tensor space equipped with the canonical norm. And I assume that U is given either as a full tensor, you have all entries of your tensor, or you already have U in a certain low rank format, but maybe with high ranks, and you would like to compress the ranks okay, to, to, to obtain some approximation of this tensor, tensor with lower complexity. OK, um, so if you have an algebraic tensor space, which is this one, it's a V1, it's just a, an Euclidean space here, uh, the, the canonical norm, I recall you, that it is a Frobenius norm, uh, whose square is defined by the sum of the squares of the entries. So think about this setting, OK? In a, in a finite dimensional setting, what I will present uh, applies to, to this setting. The result I will show you apply in infinite dimension also, but think about this finite dimensional setting for uh, making things clear. Uh, I said before that an order two tensor, U in the tensor product of two spaces V1 and V2, admit a singular value decomposition as a sum of singular values times tensor product of, of vectors that are orthonormal sets of vectors. And here, I assume that the sigma k are ordered by decreasing value. What I can do is truncate this summation up to r term. OK, so this will be a rank r approximation. And what is known is that the, the error that you commit, the distance between u and u r in canonical norm, is the best approximation error that you can expect by something of rank lower than r, OK? So you have algorithms to compute this. 
you can truncate. And so you have a procedure here which is able to give you the best. Okay? This is in order for in dimension two. Okay? You, have, you are also able to quantify this error. The square of the error is the sum of the truncated singular values. So if you have an idea about the spectral content of a tensor, what, how singular values behave, you can obtain from this uh, uh, upper bound uh, of the approximation error. Okay. Okay. Also, uh, if you select the rank of truncation uh, in such a way that the truncate, the sum of the trunc the squared truncated singular values is bounded by epsilon squared times the sum of the square of singular values, quite easy. Be and because the sum of the square of singular values is equal to the square of the norm of your tensor, you obtain that the approximation has a relative precision epsilon. So you have a, a concrete procedure to truncate with a guaranteed precision. Okay? The complexity uh, of performing SVD uh, is known. It's cu uh, a cubic uh, linearity in the size of, uh, of your uh, order two tensor. Uh, but if you give me a tensor which is already in a low ring format, and you want to compress it, compress it further, you have a reduced complexity, which is just quadratic in the, the size of the tensor, and polynomial in, in the rank of the initial tensor you, you want to compress. OK. Of course, you can extend this uh, notion to higher order tensor by considering a subset of dimensions in 1D. You matricize your tensor. Okay. Remember, this order three tensor, you, you reshape it make it a big matrix, apply an SVD, truncate, and what you obtain is that if this SVD associated with, with this matricization is truncated at rank R, the approximation you obtain is the best you can expect with the alpha rank bounded by R. Exactly the same as before, because this is an order two setting. Okay. Once I matricize, I have an order two setting. So I would like here to introduce a few um, definitions, some terminology. This decomposition here, uh, for order two tensor or matrices, we call these vectors singular vectors. And this is called singular values. For a higher order tensor, this decomposition depends on the alpha. So you see that all these things are indexed by the by alpha, okay? So the sigma k alpha will be called alpha singular values of a tensor, and these objects will be called alpha singular vector. There is also another terminology, which, is, which can be found uh, mostly in, in statistics, that uh, these are called the principal components of your tensor, or alpha principal components here of the tensor. Uh, okay. The space which is generated by this will be called uh, alpha principal subspace. Okay? Well, this is the space associated, which is generated by the singular vectors associated with the highest singular value. I call it uh, alpha principal subspace. Um, to understand the result I will show you later, I need so to introduce, okay, first, uh, an orthogonal projection from V alpha to U alpha R alpha. So this operator here is the orthogonal projection onto the principles, alpha principal subspace. But this is an operator working, acting on function of a group of variable X alpha. So from this, I can define a projector now that will act on a tensor of order D which is defined as the product of this projection operator and the identity operator. Maybe you will understand it better here. This operator, the action on a tensor, which is an, a tensor product of two vectors like this, is the projector onto the principal subspace acting on V alpha, 
tensor product with V alpha complementary. Okay, so this operator acts only on the pieces on the left. Okay, on the vectors of, of the left of the decomposition. Okay, and because you have this orthonormality property of the set of vectors here, uh, it can be easily proven that the UR you obtain here, the truncated singular value decomposition, is no more than the projection on U uh, using this orthogonal projection. Okay, if you take the quite easy to see, you have a decomposition of your tensor in this form. Um, you have uh, here the singular, the principal components. If you apply this operator on this decomposition, you will obtain a sum of the singular values time projections of this onto the dominant sing, uh, singular or the dominant principal subspace. But this principal subspace is orthogonal to all truncated vectors. Okay, so the sum will reduce to a sum from one to r. Okay. Um, the same as before, okay, about the approximation result. You can have uh, an estimation of your approximation error based on the sum of truncated singular values. Well, and now I come to tensor networks. From this, how can I build uh, an algorithm, an effective algorithm that constructs an approximation in a, in a tree-based format? There have been several variants uh, proposed. There are different ways to, to extend this notion of singular value decomposition to higher order tensor. Uh, I will show you one here uh, that will be useful for the part on learning uh, functions. This is a variant we introduced uh, recently, which is not the initial one that uh, Agbush proposed, but essentially the analysis of all these techniques is, is the same. And I will show you that which type of result we obtain. So one possible way to, to construct uh, such a truncation for tree-based format is to have a leaves to root strategy. So you will start by considering nodes of the leaves. So here I take one leaf of the of the tree. Okay. I will consider the matricization of the tensor related to this leaf and compute an SVD, truncate it. It will give me a subspace of function of the first variable. I do it for this, for, for this node also, for this node also, for all nodes. Okay? Next step, I consider an interior node here with children for which I have already computed the principal subspaces. But I will not compute the principal subspace associated with this node of the initial tensor, but of a projection of my tensor in the tense associated with the tensor product of the principal subspace of this. Intuitively, if the principal subspace I have constructed here and here capture well the, the function, are good spaces of functions of the second and third variable. Working in the tensor product of these spaces should not be too bad, okay? Um, well, so I will compute a, a SVD of the, matri of, the, of the matricization of this object U alpha and obtain a space of function of a group of variable associated with this node. And I go up like this from the leaf to the root. And at the very end, what you do, you have obtained the, an estimation, I would say, of the principal subspaces associated with these nodes. So you define a space which is a tensor product of these spaces, U alpha, for alpha being the sons of the, of the root. And you project the initial tensor in, in this space, okay? You can show that in fact this projection uh, of U is equal to a sequence of projection of U. The different projections here are associated with 
tensor product of spaces appearing at different levels. Okay? And uh, it's very similar to the root to leaf strategy proposed initially by Grazenik and uh, by Grazedic first, and um, which is in the other way. You, you start by applying to you a projection operator associated with principal subspaces of these nodes. Okay? And you go like this by increasing level from the root to the leaf. Okay, now what about the analysis of this? What you can prove, and it's quite natural to see here, in fact, if you want the error between UR and U, okay, um, you will use with a telescopic sums, I would say, so you will write U R minus this as U R minus uh, P R one times U plus P R one times U minus this guy. Okay? Then you use orthogonality, you use Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem, you split the error into two terms, and the first term is related to a first approximation result. And for the other guy, you use the fact that orthogonal projections have a norm lower, lower than one, and you go up like this, and at the end, at the end, you obtain that the squared error is bounded by a sum over all nodes of the tree of the best approximation error over vectors with a rank bounded by alpha. Uh, by the, bounded, sorry, by, by R alpha. The best approximation error you see here, associated with one matricization of the tensor, is related to a sum of truncated singular values. So you have a bound of the error in terms of all alpha singular values of your tensor that you have neglected, truncated. Okay, and based on this, you can, you can try to obtain approximation results if you know something about the singular values of, of your tensor. But in particular, what we can obtain from this result is that here you see, I minimize over vector over tensors V with uh, alpha rank bounded by R alpha, just the alpha rank or one particular alpha. So the set of V satisfying this is much larger than the set of element of my tensor format, because in my tensor format, I impose many of the ranks, including this alpha rank, okay? So here is just one of the constraints you would consider when you consider the best approximation problem in your format. So this error here is clearly lower than this best approximation error in your format, which means that the squared error is less than a certain constant times the best approximation error, and this constant is the number of alpha you have considered for uh, the number of alpha except the roots, okay? For which you, are, you, are, you have constructed principal subspaces. Okay, so, and this is an instance optimality result. We have a procedure which gives you an approximation error which is bounded by the best, the best approximation you can expect, time a constant which is square root of cardinal of t minus one. And this is related to the result uh, I, I said before. If you have a binary tree, or no, any dimension tree uh, is of cardinal bounded by two uh, d minus one, and then, Okay, I said square root of two, no, in fact, okay, ct is square root of 2d minus, and asymptotically it would be square root of 2d. Okay, this is for fixed rank. You have a guarantee that you are almost optimal, you have op almost optimal truncation of a given rank, but if you want to truncate by tr controlling accuracy, you can do it also. Each time you compute the singular value decomposition of these approximations u alpha, you truncate according to this rule, such that the, 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 squared, uh, the sum of squared singular values is bounded by something depending on epsilon and the constant you see, you see here times the norm of your tensor. 
you will obtain a truncation with a controlled relative precision. Okay? So this is implemented in different libraries and in TunSAP uh, and approximation toolbox in particular. So it's a very simple procedure. It's one line, you, it's called a truncator. Uh, you precise either the ranks or either the epsilon, and it will give you uh, an approximation UR satisfying this or, or this property. Yes? So does the last line means that the uh, precision of our approximation is exactly the same uh, the same precision with which we assigned to uh, uh, to our truncation of SVD uh, on each level? Um, so we, here you we, see that yeah. the, the the SVD for each node, the relative precision that we ask, I ask for a subspace, which gives you. Uh, uh, a precision, a relative precision, sorry, in epsilon over C. Ah, th th this is our SVD, relative SVD precision on, yeah. on, on each level of the tree. So it's uh, it's not epsilon, but epsilon squared over CT. No, epsilon squared. is the final precision you and would like. And epsilon is final. Okay. Right. But then if you ask me 10 to the minus 2, it means that for the particular uh, SVD, I will perform the truncation. I will ask a little more. Because at the end, I know that the... The, the errors will, will accumulate. So I have to, in, to impose more precision for uh, the different truncations, you see? There may be some variants where you don't impose the same precision for each node. Maybe uh, it is more pertinent to impose more precision for the leaves, less uh, on the top, but um, I, don't, I don't think it has been analyzed or uh, yeah, probably there are more clever strategy. Probably uh, also it depends on the function you consider. This is for a, a truncation precision for each SVD, which is the same, epsilon over C. And it guarantees this at the end. Okay. Um, now, last slide here on this uh, method. <clears throat> what I considered was a tensor in the space V. And I looked for a tensor format in the space V, just imposing uh, bound, bound in rings. But it may happen that the tensor U that you have is not in the space V where you want to find your approximation. It may even be in an infinite dimensional space. Assume that you have U which is in the L2 space. Clearly, to have something feasible, you will need to introduce first a finite dimensional approximation space <clears throat> and then use uh, a truncation methods to, to obtain a low rank approximation. You have to slightly modify the, the, the algorithm I presented before only at the leaf level. When you, have a, when you are at leaf alpha, if your initial tensor lives in a very high dimensional space or infinite dimensional space, Computing principal components is not a feasible task. Okay, you, you will have to, uh, you, you will just compute an approximation of these spaces. And how you do it? You compute some projection of your uh, tensor in a space V alpha of finite dimension. And, uh, and you will uh, compute principal subspace of, of this. Okay, the result you obtain is very similar. If you impose the rank, you will obtain that the error obtained by this procedure to the square is bounded by a constant, the same as before, times the squared best approximation error, plus, I would say, a discretization error, okay? Uh, the sum of the square of the error of projection of u on the space you have chosen. If you use v alpha, the spline space, wavelet space, you, you need some information about this. this uh, this error. But that, so this is the truncation part, I would say, of the error, and this is a discretization part due to the fact that you approximate in space V uh, that does not contain the U. Okay. And for fixed precision, uh, same type of result. If you want to prescribe epsilon, you, what we will obtain is something with, with, which is with this relative precision epsilon, but up to an additional term related to discretization errors. 
Okay, so these algorithms can be used for truncation of algebraic tensors. You give me a multidimensional array or a tensor network, and you can use these methods to, to truncate with fixed rank or uh, control rank. Um, there are a lot, uh, there have been uh, many work recently for uh, improving the efficiency of these algorithms, uh, of these truncation algorithms. Uh, including works of uh, the organizers of people around uh, in Paris are working on blockwise uh, tensor compression techniques. Uh, Virginie and others, I think, here. Uh, parallelization of this type of algorithm uh, with uh, Laura Grigori and other people in, uh, in, in Germany, Peter Binner and uh, Corsos. There are also works on using randomization, uh, uh, randomized uh, algorithm based on randomized linear algebra for improving this. There have been a lot of work on improving SVD using these randomized techniques, but there are also recent works on, on the extension of this randomized linear algebra technique for tensors. So a lot of things are going on on this in order to have something efficient working in. A, High performance computers to have this block uh, very efficient. Okay, and now I, I will show you uh, after uh, how this can be used. Why is it so important to have something efficient for this particular task? Okay, um, well, 20 minutes left. So, uh, I would like just to comment on this. <clears throat> so previously I was assuming that I know the tensor U, I want to compress it. But now uh, I told you that uh, it can, in principle, work in these truncation techniques in infinite dimension. Uh, the same result here. The result I show you here are valid, even if U lives in a in an infinite dimensional space, like an L2 space. Okay? Uh, but of, of course, I will have to, to, to tell you more about the way we compute these things, because this will not be a practical algorithm, a feasible algorithm if U is an infinite dimensional space. If you don't have complete information on U, you will have to replace many things here, uh, like the projection operator you see here, uh, the orthogonal projection in infinite dimension, you will not have it. So you will have to replace it by uh, some interpolation technique or least square method. Uh, the principle, uh, the SVD plus truncation, so computing a SVD and truncated in infinite dimension is not feasible, so you will have to, to do something approximated there. So I will not go into the detail, but this, is, um, this part is about uh, uh, approximation in a least square setting um, using just samples of functions. Constructing, um, based on the ideas I have presented, constructing approximation of tensors based on just evaluation of the entries of a tensor uh, is something you can find in the literature, like cross approximation methods proposed by Ozoledets, Balani, Grazedic. And also variants of principal component analysis that I that I proposed, and uh, which is uh, one part of the PhD of uh, Cecile Aberstich. This is what is presented afterwards in the, in the slide. It's a technique where uh, we are in the L2 setting. Uh, we assume that uh, we have function of. Uh, functions defined on a probability space, so you can see it as function of random variables associated with a product probability measure. Uh, it's a Hilbert setting. Uh, L2 in this setting is a Hilbert tensor space, so you have also the notion of singular value decomposition. What I introduced before in an abstract setting, you can transpose it here in this setting for multivariate functions. So everything applies, the notion of principal subspace, and so on. But now I just show you here the interpretation of 
of, of the best approximation problem, the principal subspace is solution of this problem. It's a minimization problem over all possible subspaces of dimension R alpha that minimize the distance between you and its projection onto this space. Okay, this is principal component analysis or uh, the best truncation based on SVD is equivalent to, the, to this problem. Now, if I am in this setting L2 functions defined on a probability space, the L2 norm is related to an expectation, okay? So I can rewrite this problem here, uh, sorry, this term, as an expectation of the square of the distance between this random variable here and the projection of this random variable onto the subspace U alpha. This is the, the problem of principal component analysis in statistics, where this object that you see here is a function valued random variable. For a given instance of this group of variable, you have a function of the group of variable x alpha. Okay? So what we do in practice here is replace the projection you see here by something using samples of functions based on interpolation or least square projections. So Cecile uh, worked on uh, uh, weighted least square method of Albert and uh, with these improvements called boosted least squares that Albert presented that allows to control the norm of the operator here. It, what was nice in the analysis before is that the norm of this is bounded by one. If you replace it by uh, an interpolation, you have no control about the, the norm. So there will, there, will, there will be similar theorem as presented before, but constant befo be, uh, before that you don't control. The interest of weighted least square methods is that you can have a strategy where you control the norms of the operators here using samples. And uh, second approximation is that we, of course, computing this functional with an expectation is not feasible. So you will estimate this expectation by a statistical average by sampling also the complementary variable. So at the very end, what the algorithm uses is evaluation of the function on a very structured grid. The, sam the red samples that you see here, x alpha i, are related to the projection operators, there may be interpolation points or uh, random samples for least square projections. And these are the random samples used to estimate the expectation in this PCA uh, optimization problem. Okay, and there we have obtained some, uh, some results on, on this procedure uh, under some assumption on, on the classes of functions you, you, uh, you, you approximate. Okay, this was fast. Um, the last example of the practical session, we, for, for this example, we invite you to use a, a, a procedure which is the implementation of this, uh, of this method. Okay? So you, it's quite convenient, but it's a black box approach. It's, it's not certified, okay? But you can play with it. You can, you can provide your multivariate function, run this algorithm by providing uh, epsilon accuracy. I will not guarantee, at least with the implementation today, the accuracy I want. Cecile did better, but it's not implemented in the available library. Uh, but at least you will obtain something uh, with the precision almost what, what we have, what you have. Okay, but you, you can play with it. And um, okay, and I will. Uh, some question. Um, okay, very briefly now, because uh, not so much time. If you have a problem which is given as a minimization of a functional J of V, think about. Um, empirical risk minimization uh, in statistical learning, or if you want to solve an equation AU equal B, you would like to minimize the norm of the residual to compute in practice an approximation. So, okay, 
to use tensor networks, it's quite natural to consider this optimization problem. And this is the, com the comment I, I gave before, that this problem, we don't know any algorithm to solve it, in a, uh, to solve it um, with reasonable complexity. But yet you can do, you can do things in practice, and uh, sometimes these algorithms I, I will show you uh, works quite well. What we will exploit here in the first algorithms is the multilinear parameterization I mentioned before. Remember, uh, a tensor in this tensor networks format can be written as a multiple sum of product of entries of tensors. It's linear in each of the parameters, which means that the set of tensors you consider can be written as a set of tensors that are equal to some map taking as entries the tensor, and this map is linear in each of the variables, in each of the entries, sorry. Okay? So you, this optimization problem, you can rewrite it as a, an optimization problem over the tensors of your tensor network of the composition of J with this uh, representation map C. Okay? And a very natural algorithm is called an alternating minimization algorithm or block descent algorithm where you will successively optimize over one of the tensors. If I optimize just over these tensors by letting the other fixed, the good news is that since this map is linear in this, I will inherit many properties of the initial problem. For example, if the function j is convex, uh, since this function is linear in this, the function I try to optimize over this particular tensor will be a convex functional. If j is differentiable, then this functional you optimize at this step will be also differentiable. Okay, so many nice properties. This is why it's, con it's quite convenient to use this algorithm, but as I said before, uh, there are some guarantees over this algorithm, but no guarantees that it, it will give you the, the minimizer of the problem, the, the solution or a solution of this optimization problem. There are other optimization algorithms that have been proposed, a gradient descent algorithm, a Newton type algorithm, also algorithms that exploit the, the manifold structure of these tensor networks. Uh, you can have results in the literature on lo local convergence result on this algorithm, saying that if you are not too, too far from the uh, best approximation, your algorithm will go to this best. But since you are not able to find something close to the optimal a priori, uh, not, not, not easy. So uh, you have global convergence, uh, no global convergence result. Uh, but you have convergence result to stationary p stationarity point of your functional. But we know as for neural networks that these functionals are many, many stationarity points and some of them are not good at all. And uh, you can indeed observe it in, in, uh, in practical applications. If you start from a very bad initial guess, the solution provided by this type of algorithm will be very far from what you can expect from your um, format. Um, okay, this was for optimization in a fixed, um, in a fixed uh, subset of tensors with, fixed with given ranks. And there have been different strategies to adapt the rank. Uh, the first and initial one was a strategy called modified alternating minimization algorithms. It has another name in physics, DMRG algorithm that was used for, uh, for tensor train approximation. Here, the rank adaptation is performed during the optimization. I will show you how, how it works. And there are alternative methods that I will not uh, show you that um, several authors propose, including us, that uh, are different ways to adapt the rank. The strategy we propose, very similar to what Razedic and Kramer uh, propose as a SALSA algorithm. It's a strategy where you will optimize in a subset with a given rank and then have a strategy or some criterion to, to modify the ranks. And 
depending on the criterion, you arrive to different strategies. Okay, let me describe the, the old one, the modified alternating minimization algorithm, which is quite efficient in practice, uh, that will adapt the rank on the fly. How will it be done? If you have a tensor network, uh, instead of optimizing over a particular tensor here and then another one, okay, you will, you will take a pair of tensors and try to optimize over this pair simultaneously. So in the first step, you will consider to optimize over these two things. You will contract this edge. Okay, you have a, uh, here, by the contraction here, you have a higher order tensor. The order of the tensor is the number of lines that emanates here on uh, 2 plus 3. Okay, so it gives you five order tensor. You will optimize on this tensor. So it's a new format here, eh? okay? It's associated with a new graph. These two nodes have become a, uh, um, a single node here. This edge has disappeared. Okay, so it's a new graph. But yet, the tensor network here, the parameterization is linear in this guy. So you can re-optimize over this guy. And then to come back to your initial format, you will truncate this based essentially on SVD. You could have all the truncation strategies, but usually it's done by SVD. So this tensor will be again compressed in this way as a sum of uh, product of entries of two tensors, V nu and V eta. And so after this step, you have updated both of these guys. Okay? So if here, if here the ranks uh, was uh, 10, let's say, maybe after this step and recompression, given a certain accuracy in this compression, you will end up with a lower rank, but maybe a higher rank. Okay? You don't have a control. Uh, on the behavior of the rings. Okay. Um, and let me finish with, uh, I will not do the last part, but I will comment on this. It's related to what Albert asked, because for the moment I showed you algorithm, and I told you there is no guarantee. Uh, we need a good initial guess and so on. It's not very satisfactory, but okay, there are settings where we can do things that are certified. Um, if you have an equation to solve like this or a marginal optimization problem like this, usually uh, you have, uh, you know, iterative methods that work for, for, this, for these problems. So you will use these iterative methods formally, okay? Like a gradient methods to solve this or some iterative methods, and I will show you here a Richardson iteration, uh, Richardson iterations to solve this. So you have algorithms, you know that they converge, but of course you have to exploit lowering structure, so you have to truncate somewhere, and we will use these truncation techniques that are controlled, and uh, that I showed you at the very beginning. Okay? So let me show you this on Richardson iteration. You want to solve A u equal B, Richardson iteration is construct a sequence of uh, a sequence u n equal to u n minus 1 minus omega A u uh, times the residual of your equation. Um, under some assumption on your operator A and under some associated condition on omega, you can prove the convergence of this algorithm. So, if I use um, tensor networks for uh, trying to solve this equation, at, suppose that at the iteration u n minus one, uh, you have here a representation with the tensor networks for this guy. You assume that a, b are all represented with this uh, tensor networks format, so that you are able to perform all these algebraic operations that are here. Okay, uh, and some libraries do this, including the MATLAB one I mentioned. Okay, but usually the rank of the next iterate here will blow up because here you have 
you are adding tensors. Maybe all of these guys are in a certain tensor network format with a low rank, but here I, I am adding many guys. Uh, the rank of the operator also will come into the play here. So the rank of un will be typically a product of the rank of a by the rank of un minus one plus the rank of u. Okay. That can grow dramatically. What you do very simply is truncating, introducing these truncation operators, for example, based on singular value decomposition, any truncation technique here to recompress the, the iterate. Okay? And, um, okay, after this, I, I will not go into the detail because I think I prefer taking some questions, but there are different frameworks here where I analyze this type of technique for uh, general problems given as a fixed point problem with a contractive map F. So this is a particular case of uh, the problem A U equal B if you make some a classical assumption on your operator A and on omega. Okay, suppose that you have uh, some contractivity here you know that there exists a unique solution to your problem, you know that these fixed point iterations will converge to the solution of your problem, and you know that it converges with a, a geometric uh, type convergence. Okay? So very nice algorithm here if the row is small. Okay. Now what happens if I use truncation? It's just that I will introduce an intermediate step, I apply F, and then I truncate. But now the properties of this algorithm will depend on what you use for the truncation. You can use truncation with control precision. So suppose that your truncation here do this, and you know how to implement this in practice with, a, with higher order singular value decomposition. What you know is that the algorithm will converge to a neighborhood of the solution with a radius which depends on the accuracy epsilon and gamma. And Gamma is related to the property of your initial algorithm and epsilon. Not too bad, but the ranks of the iterates for this procedure may blow up. Okay, I'm, they are not controlled, and uh, in some, for some problems you can you can go. Th um, you just impose precision, but maybe at the first iteration, for obtaining this precision, you need a very high rank. Okay, so you don't control really the rank. So you can have a procedure working with a fixed rank. So now my, trun my truncation operator gives new, give me something quasi-optimal in my subset of tensors with a, a prescribed rank. So now I prescribe the rank, but I don't prescribe anymore the, the, the precision. It's for obtaining an approximation of, uh, of the solution of an equation with a prescribed rank. You can check afterwards the accuracy and see what, what it gives. Um, the result we obtain is quite the same. You convert to a neighborhood of the solution. The size of the neighborhood is proportional to the best approximation error. So it's, the best approxim it's an instance optimality result here with here a constant which depends on uh, uh, C, which is uh, quasi-optimality of your truncation operator. And on gamma, and gamma depends on rho and c. What is not so nice here is that for this result to hold, you need a gamma which is strictly less than one. But you see that gamma is rho, the contractivity constant of your initial algorithm, times something depending on your quasi-optimality constant c, which is square root of d or square root of 2d. Uh, okay. Which means that you need a problem for which, in theory, your initial algorithm goes very fast. You will, lose, uh, you will lose here in the rate of convergence, uh, guarantee quasi-optimality, but your initial problem should be nice, and your iterative methods should be very efficient. And the last thing uh, that Schneider and Bachmeier considered is um, another truncation operator uh, based on soft thresholding of singular values. I don't know if you know this. So the, truncating the singular value decomposition, you have several ways to do it. You can do, I truncate after R term, or I can say I truncate all singular values 
uh, that are below a certain threshold. This is called hard thresholding. But then I can do something more clever. I, I can do a, a shift of the singular values by a factor two, and then take all sing singular values such that this shift is positive. This is called soft thresholding. The, inter the interest of this is that the, the map that gives you the, truncate, the, the truncated function is non-expensive. Okay, it's a Lipschitz map with Lipschitz constant one. And the result of this is that if you compose a non-expensive map T with your iteration operator F, the algorithm you obtain is with a map T, which is a composed function here, which, is ex which has exactly the same constructivity constant as the initial uh, map F. Okay? Is it clear? Ah, the norm is the norm of your problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did not. It's it's a. Uh, I considered that there is a topology in the problem I consider at the, at the beginning. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no. Uh, in fact, the norm will appear in the analysis of your problem. Uh, when I say there are conditions on operators and the omega and so on, everything is related to the norm you consider. Yeah. Uh, at least if you have a discrete problem and you want to solve uh, uh, an operator equation in a finite dimensional setting, uh, this holds for any norm. Then when you go to infinite dimensional problem and you want to, to uh, at the end, obtain uh, something, uh, there have been work from Damen, uh, Bachmeier, and also Mazen work on this to have a guaranteed procedure uh, for this. Okay, uh, and the last, so the last thing here, as I said, you you keep the same rate of convergence as the initial algorithm. Your algorithm now is guaranteed to converge to uh, some element u star, which is not the solution of your problem. But you are able to say that the distance between this and uh, this distance is controlled with respect to what? With respect to what you can expect from a, stress, um, a thresholding uh, operator applied to you. Okay, so if you have an idea about what is the approximation you obtain after soft thresholding of you, you are able to, to know what will give you this, uh, this algorithm. And the last slide of this, I don't go through them, but it's, um, these are slides I introduced, this soft thresholding operator, art thresholding, and give you some uh, comment on this, and, um, and also comment on proximal algorithms for uh, the, the solution of general optimization problems using these uh, soft thresholding techniques. And that's all. And there is a lot of references here. I classified these references uh, with respect to the different topics, truncation techniques. Uh, I included these recent works on efficient, uh, efficient versions of SVD, relaxation methods using art stress solding, soft stress solding, um, approximation using structured sampling based on either cross approximation or PCA. Also, some surveys on uh, numerical methods to, to solve tensor structured equations. Different types of techniques for this. Uh, alternating minimization algorithm with rank adaptation. Some greedy algorithms also, uh, on which worked a lot uh, Virginie in particular. But uh, we had also some contribution on this. Preconditioners in low rank formats that are quite crucial. When I said the algorithm will work if uh, the constant is uh, uh, is well controlled, but so for some uh, uh, problems, involve, enfin, for example, operator equations, you have to precondition your, your tensor, but if you want to work in high dimension, you need preconditioners that, are, that can be encoded with a low complexity within this format. So there have been some work on constructing preconditioners having these low rank tensor structures. And uh, finally, there are some papers on learning algorithms and uh, geometrical approach, uh, 
in particular for dynamical uh, low rank approximation for evolution problems. And thanks a lot for your attention. So thank you very much. Uh, and are there any? Um, but the thing is that when you go to high dimensional problem you have to exploit some uh, some structures here low rank structures or tensor networks but so what you want to compare yeah Uh, if A is a matrix, then the solution U is a vector, and I cannot exploit anything. If I, at least it's not, I'm not in this world of tensors. Or maybe you can transform your problem, as I said. If you have a, a, a vector of size 2 to the power of something, uh, you can tensorize it and exploit some structures. Ah, OK. But then you have to tell me something about the matrix. Does it admit the representation in the other world with low rank? Uh, it will depend on the structure of your, of your matrix. Uh, but you mentioned Krilov method. There have been papers from, from many authors in, mentioned here that considered not Richardson, but Krilov method to solve the problem, but in I dimension. Okay? So the U is a tensor, and you plug truncations inside a Krilov method, either rather than a Richardson, OK? But your question was different. The, is there a way to use this technique to solve a matrix vector equation? Then uh, you have to transform your problem in a way that you, you come up with a tensor problem, OK? Thank you.